Hello, dear listener. Editor JT here. We are excited to announce that by the time you're listening to this episode, our fall merch drop will be live at deprogramshop.com. Whether you want a little Fidel peeking out of your frocket, a lovingly recreated Don't Tread on Me sticker, or Hakim's patented theory-carrying tote, we've got you covered. The drop is live right now through October 15th, so go snag a hat before they're gone. All patrons will also receive a special discount, because you're our favorite little piggies. Thanks for your support, enjoy the merch, and now on to the show. Boys, I was I was just telling JT, you got something, it had, his fucking microphone's not working, bullshit, we're gonna get to that in just a second, it's always fucking something, but yeah. I was just telling JT, I'm, I'm, I'm very tired, as always, <laughs> um, but we, we should have had that for the fucking 100th episode, oh, yeah. thing. should we make <laughs> them, montage. Should, we, should we make them go back, no, no. do it again, but, uh, um, I had this fucking thing today that was just admin, it was hours and hours of fucking admin, I didn't see a single patient, I wanna fucking kill myself, nice. um, and uh, I was telling JT in confidence, but you know what? I'm going to air it out. I would rather, <laughs> I would rather have 50 patients on the docket, on my list, whatever the fucking correct English is, of just straight prostate exams than do one hour of admin. I would rather finger 50 men in a row for eight hours than have to do a singular hour of fucking admin. I hate fucking admin. <laughs> you know the, 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 the I hate the Antichrist thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> fucking, I fucking, I, I hate admin. Oh. That's number one. And number two, we, we hopped on to record, and uh, you got an exp- he recently changed tech stuff and the recording had a delay and there's always fucking something we do this every <laughs> fucking week sometimes several times a week and there's always one of us something doesn't fucking work right it's like when you go to your car or something and just something is off you go to your work and the the, the screen is not working for some whatever the f- fucking and you have to fuck around with the ancient vg the vga cable yeah. that they still fucking use <laughs> yeah. and for some reason it's not screwed in but if it's screwed in on on one side it doesn't work but if you screw on only the other side it does uh, yeah all right. it's always gonna... silly bullshit too it's like boys yeah. the g key on my keyboard doesn't work i can't get to google docs <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my god sorry so you got me you're gonna launch into your beautiful voice Go i don't know no, no. I, I heard apparently apparently that uh you can judge a person who has a penis's health based on the health of their erections. Uh, mm, Dr. Yes. Hakim, is that true? Mm, yes, it is very true. Uh, microvascular health is um, uh, your your the strength and duration duration of your erections is a in uh, indicator of microvascular health um, <laughs> to an extent. You can't kind of like blanket statement that, of but course. if you have um, decently long lasting and uh, mighty erections, may I add. Uh, then uh, you're in decent health at the very least. You can have a stroke and a heart attack, but it still works. Um, <laughs> diabetics sometimes ba- feel bad for them. Uh, diabetics can get severe microvascular issues, and they they can have uh, difficulty in that in that area. I have a few diabetic friends, so I'll make sure to use this against them. <laughs> oh yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Uh, you can. <laughs> no, 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 As if they don't have enough sure to have. deal with. No, no, no. <laughs> exactly I, right. no but they, they, they might lose. They are some of the people with the greatest sense of humor that I've ever fucking met, and not even That's like true, yeah. super self-inflicting and. Like, uh, it's not like that they talk about having diabetics, diabetes mm-hmm. all the time, but it's always like some like situation, like for example, I know two weeks ago with a good friend of mine and I'm like, uh, man, I wish that in like 60, 17 years, we still get together like this, you know, on the table, food, drink, conversation, music, beauty, mm-hmm. and the diabetic is like, yeah, you guys are probably going to enjoy it. <laughs> I ain't going to be there. And I'm like, oh, fuck <laughs> me, fuck me. And he doesn't no, ruin the fine. mood. He just said, Elevates it, but like no, we yeah. gotta, you know, get you fixed up and shit, blah blah blah. But um, the medications no. for diabetes now are ridiculous. It's really good. Like it's yeah, yeah, yeah alhamdulillah. It's, it's a fanta- fantastic work. Um, as long as it's actually available to you. Yeah, for yeah, free. yeah, yeah, of course. It doesn't cost like half like, a house. Yeah, yeah it's exactly. Like three thousand bucks a month here. Yeah. Fuck! What the hell? How do you live? You may as well just die. Yeah. <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> it's like I'm alive, but I'm like I can't what do cost? anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my god! I bet it's it's probably cheaper to go and have like a a small vacation in Canada. Get yeah, the exactly. Yeah, that's exactly and what come they back do. down. Yeah, that yeah. is what people. Birdie's platform, big time. Mexico, yeah. uh, Canada. There are lots of different places where where people will go. That is cheaper to take the trip, stay there in a nice hotel, mm. get the medication, and then come back. It's wild. Yeah. I'm surprised, uh, like people don't do like homebrew insulin at this rate. They do I'm have sure. some. There are yeah. some. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's yeah. bootleg insulin that you can get, and it, you know it's oh not like God. it's not like moonshine where it's gonna make you blind or something. It's yeah. like they they know what Less they're doing. These are yeah. yeah, these are medical trained people who are just kind of mm. doing it 
in the gray market area just because mm. that's the right thing to do. But yeah, it's it's very interesting. But what about profits, JT? Mm. What about profits? Well, profits yeah, we had <laughs> we had I think in Serbia there was like a movement of so-called angel dealers or whatever they call themselves, and That's cool. they would uh, they gave meth out for free. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. no, for for for, for terminally terminally ill patients as well as patients who like uh, have uh, diseases that don't kill them, but like it just hurts like a motherfucker. Uh, mm. Apparently, THC like helped them out a lot with uh, you know not feeling like they're gonna yeah. die every fucking second. Mm -hmm. So so and uh, it's very illegal in Serbia up until recently. Actually, I think. Even even CBD Strange. to this day is, is illegal. Really? So, yeah. So they, uh, you know, these angel dealers would like for free just uh, make this shit and then uh, and then give it to uh, to people with uh, these sorts of uh, particular really cool. health problems and so on. Yeah, it's very nice. That's fucking community organizing a part of what yeah. we're going to talk about today and shit. But, uh, but yeah, no, I, uh, back to the previous topic. I remember when, like, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm proud of my little pecker down there. But back when I was vegetarian mm. for five years, so, like, I absolutely no fucking meat like it worked like even better bro there's huh. something about just not having i don't know age. oils or age whatever well. you think age? no man like i, I wasn't <laughs> eating uh, goat i wasn't eating pig i wasn't eating chicken i was just straight avocados and, and tomatoes and cheese well, let's look it up hold on ah. let's look it up uh erection Vegan quality cock, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's take a look i am not a get, fucking get, robot no, get please that vegan dick, you know get that vegan dick as they say it mm. might be it might really be good i don't think they say that consumption <laughs> of a healthy plant-based diet is associated with a decreased risk of erectile dysfunction a cross-sectional mm, suck my the dick there you go health. yeah uh and <laughs> well uh, we show that a health a healthful that's a new word for me healthful plant-based diet associated with less chance of having erectile dysfunction yeah of course because uh you have to kind of there is that goes with the heart uh, health thing right yeah exactly right yeah. um i wouldn't be i wouldn't be surprised but you got to remember that there's also a um, quality of patient base or, or like selection criteria that's missing here. Mm. People who tend to be vegetarian or vegan tend to also be care about their health slightly more. Yeah. Uh, they tend to be tend to exercise more amongst other things. Um, if you're just gonna get a random sample of, of meat drinkers, they're also probably meat heavy drinkers. alcohol drinkers, <laughs> meat, meat drinkers, <laughs> meat eaters, <laughs> meat eaters. They're also gonna be probably be like more than just you know. Uh, true, regular true, use true. like yeah they're gonna have certain intake of alcohol I'm not, I'm yeah. Yeah. Uh, but isn't but isn't that funny like there's a whole conversation about skinny dick or whatever the fuck they call it like super skinny guys apparently are hung as horses and shit and I, I, I don't know it's like to me ignore like you know biology and health and all this complicated stuff to me there's like some sort of like weird karmic justice and I'm saying this is like a big guy right uh, mm. that uh, most likely the steroided out fucking gorilla motherfucker that, you know, lives in the gym and like takes extra, extra chemical stuff so that he gets bigger and swoller and of swoller, course, yeah. you know, not very naughty. Most likely <laughs> that guy will like not really, you know, like fuck your brains out. While the like- He won't be able to get erect. Yeah. Most Before, likely, there yeah, you go. Yeah, which, yeah. you know, I'm not making fun. Now he's going to sound like I'm making- mm -hmm. Not, okay, to an extent, I guess I am. Fuck you. Like you're putting fucking uh, yeah, chemicals no, in yourself yeah. to be swole. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not going to call that a disability. Steroids. Yeah, please yeah, do not you use should steroids. not use steroids. It is a bad idea across the board. And also, by the way, yeah, the one thing that you're thinking about, you're just going to get very, it's going to fuck up with your aggression. It's going to fuck up with your mental health. So and, much with uh, aggression. So many of my friends yeah. have, like, when they were younger, took steroids. And to this day, they have fucking moments where they just click off. And it's extremely funny when you're, like, this, like, normal-looking <laughs> guy like myself. And you're in a group of four or five guys that, you know, used to take this. And they're all, like, 130 fucking kilo monstrosities. And then yeah, they exactly. get in a verbal fight. But they all respect you. And you're just standing in between them shouting at them to not fucking kill each other <laughs> because you can't talk to them normally because they literally cannot talk normal. They are yeah, shouting uh, their fucking lungs out because their like brain is just wired different or whatever. Yeah. No, it's, not only this, but also they're not. You're not gonna put on nearly as much muscle as you think you will. It still takes a lot of work. And by the way, all those new nice muscles that you built, uh, you're gonna. You're not gonna. If if you manage to even attract any women through this, which by the way, just have being a, a good person and having yeah. a good personality will get you much farther in that regard. Um, you're not even gonna be able to seal the deal because you won't be able to get it up. <laughs> What's the fucking point, <laughs> right? Uh, let alone many other issues like. Yeah, yeah, you, you you shave years off your life because of this shit. Yeah, um, I will say now I I do not advocate steroid use. I think it's gross and I think it's it's irresponsible. But 
it is interesting to see like if you look at bodybuilding competitions and stuff today mm. they're all juiced up and so it's yeah. interesting just to see you know 100 percent or probably 105 percent of what human capacity is for muscle mm. growth because these people they're basically a different species at this point it's like a living science <laughs> exactly. experiment yeah. space like, marines wow, look, shit. that dude looks like a bull i serve the emperor <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like oh, fuck. So I served the emperor. Ge- yeah. Gears of War looking. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. 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 It's just fascinating. Oh it's like wow. Uh, okay, so that's yeah, what exactly. humans have the potential to look like. It's weird. There, sh- yeah. There should be a what's it called? Like an Olympics, a steroid. Olympics, yeah. Yeah. Where yeah you that'd just, be really interesting. Can maximize what the human body can possibly do. And then they all die afterwards, of course. But it'd be interesting uh, yeah, to watch. <laughs> exactly right. If if you, arguably if you like make it relatively legal, which at this point it kind of is, and you yeah. invest, you know, scientific research into it, you might be able to make it safer and so on. But like my whole spiel and like perspective at the end of the day is arguably the same one that these same bodybuilders have is once you are conscious of exactly what you're doing to yourself and once you're like, okay, getting swole is is worth worth it because getting swole is my life's purpose you know this is my fucking yeah. shit then god bless bro fucking do it oh, you want to shave off 50 years of your life you want to you know the little pecker not to fucking work god bless mm. if that is what you want to do then that is what you want to fucking do it's, it's yeah. like with all, no that, that's that, that's the thing that uh, you know drives you and you need to take substances in order for it to drive you, you know not everybody wants to have a nine to five uh, normal job uh, uh, family and a dog uh, uh, Labrador always that fucking runs uh, outside of your house. Some people want to get sw- swole. Some people want to jump out of planes. Some motherfuckers want to kill motherfuckers. Like these are all mm. legitimate uh, jobs. No, legitimate. <laughs> yeah, ex- ex- except if you do it for capital, of course. You know, uh, yeah. uh, it's, it's still kind of good. Yeah. It's just, it's just a little socialism right. good. Uh, yeah. Right, JT, you you can you know what to do with this yeah. conversation. <laughs> let, let people wonder what he's been saying. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Speaking of speaking of, of, of murdering uh, and pillaging, uh, no. Speaking of health <laughs> health stuff, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night today, and I had two uh, spots on my neck that were just uh-uh. slightly red and a bit like a like a, a bump. So the, the, most likely, uh, what's it called? Uh, mosquito bites. But they are so precariously placed in in like hickey area uh, uh, on my yeah. neck. And it just it, it the first thought that came to my mind is you got my must have astral projected into my bedroom and gave gave, 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 gave me a little smooth. Why did you tell neck. him, man? I like this is why I'm having problems with my microphone. I'm literally in, in Iraq right now, like using yeah. some random like, giving me kisses. At the, I just into couldn't the night. help it, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No yeah. wonder I slept so well tonight. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I expect I expect uh, fan art. Of of Yugopnik. spirit Yugopnik. like a vampire, <laughs> like the exactly. vampire from Baldur's <laughs> Gate going into uh, Hakim's Give apartment. Me pics. Uh, Don't forget I mean, the blue wall, the blue walls with the fucking uh, with the holes and the evil yeah, statues. Yeah, I, I would. If that's exactly what I wanted to say, I would have given you much more, baby. But I was like disgusted by your apartment, so I was like, <laughs> okay, a little kiss on his neck and I leave. You know, like that again, meme. I guess we're talking about uh, women's perspectives without actually having women on here. But uh, it's a very good, it's a very good uh, complaint that they have about you know you like this guy, he's cute, he's nice. You go to his place and the sheets have not been washed in three months, and you go hey, to the you. toilet. My sheets are always clean. <laughs> <laughs> and you go to the toilet, and he's literally washing his hair with fucking a dishwasher soap and shit. And okay, you're like, oh my yeah, fucking no. god! And sneaks and he's got out. Got a single of the folding apartment. chair and the TV on the floor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah, fucking, yeah. <laughs> I keep an impeccable household, mind you. Absolutely. I believe, and it's, it, I believe it, it. It has been fixed up since the <laughs> except <laughs> since the eight months ago. The wall <laughs> yeah. and the hiding no, the, those, below the bed and the no, no, that's yeah. all sorted now. I'm above the bed, mind you, and all the holes are filled and painted over. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I made sure I made sure all the holes were filled yesterday. I can tell you Uh, of course yeah there we go (laughs) hello everybody and welcome back to the D program today we have a very special episode where we're going to be talking about uh, in in accordance with Lenin's very famous work, uh, what we about to do? All right, <laughs> everybody knows the fucking with his hands out, hand outstretched. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, we want to thank our patrons for all the very very generous support that we get from them. We wouldn't not we would definitely not be able to do any of this. Um, I would be uh, significantly more tired um, and <laughs> even less able, capable of doing this without their help. That and likewise, we have some banger merch, absolutely yeah. flawless fucking drip that's waiting for you, people. 
people. Go and, and check out. We, we have the new fucking link. I'm, like, I'm not going to sound Deprogramshop.com, the... baby. There we go. There we go. For all <laughs> professional. Um, go check it out. We have fantastic, fantastic uh, new artwork for you guys. What's yeah, we're really piece, proud actually? of this stuff. We really like on, making yeah, this stuff. G- give me a favorite piece. Come on. Uh, Pocket Castro. Mine, mine Pocket is Fidel. Castro. Yeah. yeah, the Pocket Castro has to be. Uh, I fucking love that one. That one and the the snake. Yeah, uh, the, the Ouroboros with the deprogram on the shirt. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely fantastic. I really Mostly. like the play on uh, the logo <laughs> the of uh, Wagner. Wagner. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. The Porky Killers, that, that is par- Porky Hunters. That is sick. Yeah. And actually, the, the patch has been selling a lot. I don't know why yeah. not necessarily the T-shirt, I guess, because people don't want to wear it in the street. It's very good like the they're yeah. Wearing yeah, the, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, it looks like they're wearing the actual Wagner thing. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> like in Eastern Europe, I am not wearing that part of my own merch. I yeah. can tell you that. Uh, people really like the hat that says because it's very mm. aggressive. I guess uh, relatively larpy, but very aggressive. Your kids will be Marxist. I like that That's one fun. as well. But uh, we try to we try to make the majority of the merch not just you know cool drip that you would wear, but stuff mm. that is like outwardly propagandistic, right? So while you're mm. wearing it, you're basically wearing a poster. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully you know not it's not gonna convert anybody, but it might trigger mm. a couple of rightoids into rethinking uh, just how cocked they are. Sorry. Yeah. Came back to you. No, 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 it's completely fine, Habibi. Uh, but uh, what was I gonna say? Yeah, uh, the, the, it's absolutely fantastic, Mert. So you, everybody, please do go take a look. Uh, and yeah, also let us know uh, what you what you guys think about it. With all that being said, though, let's let's actually get into the meat of, of today's episode, which is um, what the the details or like the inner workings, or more appropriately, the specifics of what happens before. Uh, the revolution during the day of the revolution and then the preliminary post-revolutionary period Um, because there's a lot of talk of theory particularly amongst uh, like modern capitalist um, Marxists or or left-wing people within capitalist countries nowadays they always kind of tend to focus on getting to revolution but nothing Mm -hmm. past that point Um, very interesting I was reading a book uh, recently Uh, it's um, you reading a book? Oh, that's fucking oh my surprising. God. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my god! Um, I, I, you know, it's a big, it's a big fucking mess for me. I, I, I don't read nearly as much as I used to. And it shut the! Me. I hate uh, these fucking humble bragging cunts, man. <laughs> shut the fuck up, man! I swear to fucking god. Continue. Like, like, oh, I like do not save as many lives as I used to it's save it's before. It's, it's putting the pee. I, I, in the fucking, I only in the, fuck in the, my wife for an hour, not two hours. Like that, I that's what this does. I love it. Oh my I mean, God! But yeah, uh, yeah, something that I loved. Uh, well, I highly recommend a book. It's uh, Socialism and Chinese Characteristics: A Guide oh, for yeah. Foreigners by Roland Bower. It's a fantastic. That looks book. great. It's really, really good. I highly recommend it. But in it, he specifi- specifies how, because he, as a professor, when he was when he would teach in Chinese universities, he would focus a lot on the groundwork of like you know uh, pre-revolutionary theory. Um, and Chinese students were very interestingly uninterested in that aspect. Huh. They were way more interested in the building socialism bit. They kind of almost didn't care about. In fact, he even mentioned some students kind of calling him out and be like, "We already, we've already had a revolution, right?" It's huh. very based of them. That's um, kind of cool. But, yeah, yeah, exactly right. But that's an interesting, Optimistic. like, yeah, yeah, parallel to have. Um, for us, uh, in most, in all of, of our respective area areas and regions, there has not been a revolution yet. Mm. Inshallah, there will be. Though uh, the a period prior to the revolution, there's a few things that we need to cover in regards to specifics. That means actual detail. This does not mean that we're presenting a blueprint. Uh, we're simply analyzing history, seeing what they had done, what worked, what didn't, and we're just kind of we're gonna present it to you guys for as food for thought. Um, of course, there's constant work across many uh, groups uh, in the West and in the East and everywhere else uh, about what is relevant and appropriate for the different different material conditions that exist within all the respective regions of the world. Uh, that doesn't mean that you should just take some somebody else's example and then try to apply it mechanically to yours. Revolution cannot be exported and cannot be superficially imposed. You have to carry out a correct material analysis of your condition, right? If you want any sort of inspiration, Lenin's work on the development of capitalism in Russia or uh, Mao's work on uh, class analysis in, um, it wasn't Yunnan, I don't remember the exact area mm-hmm. now, uh, but his his work. The, these are very um, core aspects. If you want another a good example, um, Batatu's work uh, on uh, the social classes uh, and revolutionary uh, groups within uh, Iraq um, is a fantastic, like huge volume um, about that. That's another example of this. Regardless, enough book recommendations and enough um, intro. 
when it comes to the area or the period before the revolution, the number one central thing that needs to exist is organizations. Uh, what exactly is an organization? An organization is a group of dedicated revolutionaries. That is usually what is meant with the Marxist-Leninist example. It could be otherwise. It could be student groups. It could be women's rights groups. It could be uh, minority, like either ethnic or otherwise groups, amongst many others. These organizations need to have, number one, a political program. Number two, this political program needs to be based in an analysis, a correct analysis of the material conditions that exist. Number three needs to be based on the mass line. And of course, number four, and this is the most important bit, th there needs to be a unified approach towards carrying out decisions, of course, through democratic process and whatnot. But there, the, the levels of factionalism, to an extent at least, do need to be limited. Yeah. We'll, we'll get into these, these specific details. I'll mention a few points just generally, um, and then you guys can kind of hop in before I, before I hand it off to you, Gopnik, uh, for the excellent write-up that he has for this. Two examples that exist frequently all throughout our history is, uh, I'm going to use the the the, um, the Maoist terminology for this, but everybody, had every even Lenin had his own terminology for this. Um, the tailing before the masses bit and the adventurism bit. This is essentially when an organization, a dedicated organization that has as its explicit goal revolution and the overthrow of capitalism uh, and the building of the institution of the building of socialism, the group, if it is standing behind the general political impetus of the population, as in the general mass of people is progressing towards a development politically that the party doesn't recognize or the organization doesn't recognize or isn't there theoretically. We're standing at a point of possibly revolution and the party is not either completely unprepared or believes that it's not an appropriate time because of erroneous reasons. There could be correct reasons that it's not uh, the right time. A good example of this would be the July days, for example. The Bolsheviks yeah. did not believe mm -hmm. that it would be correct to try to seize power at that point, and that's why that, that failed, and then it required a few months uh, until it could be successful. Um, that's a correct example of analysis that could be like, okay, actually, no, the organization is correct. The, the, it's not exactly ready. The conditions aren't yet laid. Another example to the inverse of incorrectly assessing the situation is the example of the Italian Communist Party during uh, the late uh, tens of the previous century, um, where there was a general strike called and a, essentially a massive revolutionary movement that was about to take off and it did in fact take off many factories were taken over by workers certain areas and, and important administrative centers were taken over by workers uh by armed militias of workers etc but the communist party did not call for the immediate mobilization of all mm. their forces and all the masses that could that did listen to them and as a result that revolution failed and then laid the groundwork for Mussolini's bullshit um and just general fascism development in in, in Italy this was a major major mistake um and that has resulted because of an incorrect analysis of the situation but back to my point behind the masses basically means that you're not where they are they are at a they're more politically developed than their organization that is a major mistake usually as a result of either ossification uh, or general like reformist trends they refuse to meet uh, the demand for revolution or because of uh, like ceaseless factionalism um, that results in basically making the group impotent and uh, way more infighting and focusing on criticizing each other than rather than, rather than developing an appropriate analysis. Of the or just plain elitism of thinking that, yeah. oh, because, uh, you know, we are party members, we understand more than the masses, and therefore we need to tell them what to think instead of the other way around. Exactly right. Uh, on the inverse, I can. there's many more examples on this, but we can discuss that at a later point. Uh, the other side of this coin is ultra-left nonsense, usually adventure. Ah, <laughs> my this, flock uh, this, favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this, this, ta this takes the form, usually, of uh, rather than being bef behind the masses, they're way far ahead of the masses. The organization isn't more politically developed per se, but they, are, um, they didn't carry out the correct analysis of the situation, or they believe, for example, there's the situationists were like this. Um, if you don't know who the situationists are, cringe French people. That's all you need to know. Um, they were wrong. It's a little redundant, isn't every, it? Yeah. <laughs> Except the French communist <laughs> uprising. But yes. I love it. Yes. Um, but uh, nice point. You got Apologies me. to uh, the yeah. French. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. They were kind of the first ones to do it. No matter how much we shit on them, like when you really think about it, kind yeah. of the first ones to do it. But, yep. you know, the OG French. No, uh, there's a joke about uh, like uh, Balkan people and First uh, First World War, Balkan men, like all of the, all of the courageous men. Uh, the reason 
reason that it's all like fucking cunts now is because all the men with courage died uh, in World War One. Because, like, for example, Serbia lost fifty percent of its male population. And the joke that you can use from this context for the French is like all the French that that mattered fucking just <laughs> got killed in the Paris Commune oh. and everything afterwards. You know, okay, so Polish, like, um, you got like famous from... uh, eugenicists. So there we go. <laughs> Moving aside from absolutely unrepentant and very based French <laughs> racism, or racism against the French more appropriately. <laughs> People will take this seriously, we're joking. Anyways, um, the, the, the point was the, the adventurism part. This basically means that the, again, either stemming out of elitism or an idea that um, if we were to make the situation, if we were to try to spark a revolutionary point, then the masses will suddenly wake up and try to carry forward the revolution. This is not right. If you do not carry out the appropriate political work amongst working people and other associated groups that could be allied with the proletarian cause, then what you end up with is essentially a impotent movement with a bunch of very highly motivated but incorrect ideologically placed people. Circle who, jerking, yeah. Yeah, circle jerking, and if they get arms and whatnot and they try to do something, then all they end up doing is making their group look like essentially ter a terrorist uh, group. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And as a, as a result of this, they end up actually alienating the vast majority of people from the thing that they want to bring forward. A good point on all this was... This is also assuming that revolution is the point of these organizations. If you are of the persuasion that, uh, oh, no, but we maybe can reform, blah, blah, our third, I think, ever episode that we made was reform versus mm -hmm. revolution. So do go have a listen there. I'm not going to rehash those points. Uh, we're going to get into a little more detail. There are certain practical points or bits of uh, information that can be uh, conveyed. And this is all based on the historical analysis of all uh, successful revolutionary groups. The fundamental first step was the founding of an organization. This organization, the, the, no matter where it is, needs to be founded on the correct ideological basis. This correct ideological basis arises from a correct analysis of the material conditions. What does that actually entail? This entails looking at, number one, the class structure of the society that you currently live in. Um, what is the percentage of actual proletarians? What is the percentage of people who would be considered bourgeoisie? What is the class nature of the petty bourgeois groupings in your nation? Are there peasant populations? If so, what is the breakdown of said po peasant populations? What is the individual ha land ownings between all these people? Do they hire other labor or do they only work their land themselves? Likewise, if you live in a comparable or bourgeois country, then are there certain members of the, of the capitalist class that are uh, nationalistic or patriotic uh, in a way that would resist the influence of power, for whatever reason, uh, of the... Uh, bourgeois comprador uh, class that exists that possibly c uh, continues to rule in your country. This was an example, for example, uh, in, in, in uh, China. Uh, these are all very important things you need to carry out an analysis of. What exactly is the class structure of your society? Based on this, then you know what to target. Um, if the vast majority of your population is peasant-based and you're trying to push a strictly proletarian line, meaning you're only talking about workers and factories or whatever, or whatever kind of breakdown of, of labor that you have in your society, then the vast majority of people who would be important in carrying out the revolutionary movement, your, your words would fall on deaf ears because it doesn't meet their reality. Right? Likewise, if you live in a highly industrialized nation with the vast majority of people being office workers, for example, if you're going to talk endlessly about like peasant interests uh, and there basically and basically no peasants exist in your society, then again, that is wasted effort. Uh, likewise, for example, if you live in one of these in-between countries, a lot of Arab countries fall in this sphere where you have a very sizable percentage of what you would consider petty bourgeois ownership, small cafes or bookstores or whatever else, like small um, uh, offices for things, um, legal work or notarizing offices, um, photography places, like no major chains. It's just very small, you know, Mom I own it. And I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Mom, yeah, exactly right. Thank you. You need to have an analysis that would, and, and a political program that would meet the interests of these people in a with a proletarian tilt, right? Because that's the end. Of, that's the end goal, right? To the the, the tilt towards socialism. And what, the way that you can make this uh, attractive to them is uh, through um, creatively analyzing and then applying, and maybe even creating novel Marxist um, applications. Uh, and that's why reading theory is important, of course. Especially for the modern context adapted to understanding just uh, what kind of population you're working with. Uh, the political identity is no longer kind of at the same level of... Uh, 
a class identity as it was during most of the previous, uh, let's call them, uh, revolutions of the past. And right now, political identities, for example, using a more modern context, especially the Western one, a lot of political identities are more linked to social issues of this and that sort. So w when you are pitching your uh, class conscious uh, ideas, uh, be it from the proletarian perspective, be it from the PMC perspective, or <laughs> even the peasant perspective, which arguably almost nowhere except in uh, certain parts of Africa kind of exists, uh, at least not as an identity of a peasant class, but farmers which consider themselves uh, not even petite bourgeois, but like big bourgeois, but that's a different topic. Uh, you, need to, you need to integrate these sort of s social, political identities that these particular people have into the messaging that you're, you're pushing forward. Because I don't know, 50, 60 years ago, you go and you say, oh, you know, I'm fighting for factory workers and so on, and that would click. Nowadays, that would click but how many actual factory workers mm -hmm. especially for example in the first and second world uh, do you have and even if you do have a shit ton of factory workers they no longer necessarily identify as factory workers they identify as uh, factory workers with the this or that or that or that particular set of beliefs so th that's the only thing I'm, tr I'm trying to smudge in is uh, uh, when pitching to the particular when uh, cutting up the demographics that you are trying to reach as a particular organization be it a niche organization or, you know, a mass line thing trying to get as many people in. You need to understand that the, 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 uh, the way you approach them uh, will, will very much so depend on the political identity of the individuals that you're trying to get. But that does not mean that you stay away from quite literally the only main point that all socialist organizations need to make. And that is, you know, a class analysis of what is going on. Uh, so you take all of these particular social issues that people might uh, might really, really care about or be very, very pissed about, and you link it directly, which is, would not be a lie at all, but you link it directly because it, it, it is the material reality of the world with the class dynamics of capitalism, which cause, for example, racism, which cause homophobia, which cause the male-female relationship or oppression inside of the family, et cetera, et cetera. So you can, you can both target people based on class, and that is obviously going to be the majority of the, your actual communique as, uh, as an organization, but also you can target social issues through class analysis. Never get rid of class analysis, obviously, then you just become a fucking liberal. Uh, mm -hmm. And through that, in, again, in the modern context, you can, you can reach more identities than, uh, than you know, just, uh, just the class identity, which very unfortunately uh, is not uh, as uh, materialized as, as it used to be, which is super fucked up because it used to be also not very material until socialized came, socialists came and told them, yo, man, like you're an actual pro, like stop fucking working mm. for the big man and so on and so on sorry just adding like whatever uh, m modern twists to uh, to what our forefathers uh, forefathers did at least from my perspective no beautifully added uh, beautifully put have you as is my stereotype to say it, but the, the, <laughs> the, the reason i say it so often is because of how beautiful uh you these points always are um, so you can blame him. <laughs> Have you been? No, please always anyway. say it. You're like my fucking ideological daddy. Whatever you tell me, oh. tell me. Beautiful point. It's like my, my week is better. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Day. I wish I was kidding. I, I, mean, I, I know I'm sucking <laughs> your dick right now, but I wish I was kidding. Have you been? Uh, yeah. Now, uh, after that interlude of, of uh, extreme bro love... Um, <laughs> And, and several ejaculations. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, we're getting back to the important point, which is the mass line. And that doesn't mean... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, but wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, 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 if, if you put coke on, on a dick, wouldn't it get the guy... Like, even if the guy doesn't snort, but the guy who has coke on his dick, wouldn't it get him high? At least if it gets no, on the no, glands. No, no. On the gla well, not no, even no. the glands? I would he get him will... high if it's on the glands. Some, no, no, he won't get high. He'll get slight numbing on the area that it's placed on. Okay, on the like on the teeth yeah, yeah. shit. Okay. Exactly right. Exactly. Like he was um, like, trust me. <laughs> trust me. <laughs> yeah, bro, I've been there. <laughs> I put coke on my dick. Mm. Dude, I use, I use uh, like, lidocaine and carbocaine. I use them almost daily. Uh, not on myself, like on patients. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really into okay. the numbing but, sensation. Yeah. Exactly right. 
you're right. It helps me last longer when we're with you. That like he's just supporting thing. my theory that like secretly, you know, he's he he's hating on alcohol, but he's like the hardcore fucking coke. Fiend. <laughs> I'm like, the biggest yes. coke head. <laughs> like, hardcore coke fiend. Oh yeah. my god. Uh, oh sorry. Lord. Back to the taking. Back the to the slide. important material. Yes. Excuse yeah. me. The, the unimportant information. Yeah. Because uh, that's that's what people need from this episode. Um, what I was saying is, you need to develop a correct political line. All right. The way of uh, you know carrying out the proper class analysis of your society that cr- gives you the draft kind of like the skeleton framework how do you get to the nitty-gritty details right this differs from societies and society in time to time and place to place based on something called the mass line the mass line was something that was explicitly given a name by mao but existed even in prior iterations even back to the bolsheviks that's what um uh, peace bread land was it was an application of the mass line um what this is is what what this is is Lama. What this is, um, <laughs> this is how stupid English is. What this is is <laughs> I literally is 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 fucking stupid language. Uh, <laughs> what this is essentially, you try to create a a set of questions essentially to go to the to to general people of the relevant class background that you're interested in of the relative relevant area etc. And you essentially based around your. Uh, political analysis, uh, class analysis of the society around you, you try to present things that you would think would appeal to their particular interests, right? To use an example, uh, in many countries, land reform was a big thing for peasantry. So one application of the mass line would be for these uh, left-wing groups to to advocate for and be in constant discussions with regular everyday peasants about concerning the question of Land reform, not basically only land reform, but reorganization. So essentially taking out of big land uh, land owners from uh, aristocratic uh, holdings or or uh, feudal uh, ownership or whatever have it, the latifundia example in Latin America uh, and uh, distributing it amongst peasants who actually work the land. Right, yeah. that's the the common phrase that will be boiled down. the the person who works the land is the one who owns it. Mm-hmm. Uh, was a very successful example of the mass line being applied and distilled to just essentially a single phrase in regards to the land question you go to the to the to the masses i it always feels very larpy to say masses but people understand what i'm trying to say yeah. you go to the masses with this and you present this idea and then you get feedback from them on this right they'll give you your opinions you sit there and listen because you're, you're there to fucking learn uh you you listen you take notes you go back to the organization who is politically educated ideologically um advanced enough to be able to distill these even further and then go back to the group of people, the masses that you're interested in in, in getting their perspectives. Uh, You discuss with them again and back and forth and back and forth until you distill it to the most core and important and most appropriately correct uh, analysis of the situation in a political form. For example, you do, land you, reform. So, before you go on, you do a market analysis on the ROI of your <laughs> communist propaganda. Yes. Exactly. exactly. Essentially, mm-hmm. essentially right. To, to put it in a very <laughs> disgusting way. Disgusting way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> Guys, we don't have return on investment on this particular peasant class. We need to concentrate <laughs> on a peasant class that makes between 7,000 and 12,000 because the guys between 4,000 and 6,000 are kind of at this point, uh, we should classify them as lumpens. Lumpens obviously <laughs> do not support our <laughs> fucking cause of the, I'm sorry yeah, that's I, I, can, I can imagine like a, a oh, future yeah. like corporate yeah. like uh, they're sitting in a boardroom a bunch of commies and like look at this <laughs> this is not what you're supposed to like I'm sorry please go on this, no but this, this, this brings a very good this brings a very excellent point uh, as always uh, into the you know prior like pre-revolutionary build up which is a lot of people don't realize just how many of their everyday skills actually translate over yes, to organizational yeah, abilities. Yeah. Um, and this is a perfect example of it in Yugopnik's uh, case. Um, JT, uh, of course, his extensive ability at general propaganda uh, or propaganda uh, propagandizing as well as video editing and, and editing of texts and scripts and whatnot. Um, this is indispensable in this example. Um, my skills, which are more "quote unquote" traditional, I guess, come in the very in the very simple form of yeah, we're going to have less doctors after the revolution because mm-hmm. of war or conflict or essentially brain drain. This is always this is a common thing historically that has happened, so it's not surprising to assume that this would happen. We're jumping the gun here. This is day of the revolution stuff. We'll get there. Uh, but whatever you think. Um, currently, the person listening, you have most definitely 110 percent a skill that would be invaluable to the revolution. So yeah, don't 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 be disheartened. Mm-hmm. All right, you don't need to be you know the the the, the planning guru. You don't need to be uh, <laughs> what's it called um, longitudinal math. I don't fucking know. One uh, of those one of those nerds yeah. <laughs> to be but able who, to and all. But yeah. also like the the person listening who does the organizing, like you you need people from professors to soldiers to union members to managers to civil workers to doctors. Etc. Etc. Like keep an open mind on uh, who enters. Obviously, a, a bit of skepticism before letting them through the door for people who are much mm. closer to capital. Obviously, but 
I, I don't think I would be wrong to say that, I don't know, except rapists and pedophiles, pretty much everybody <laughs> is welcome as long as, you know, they believe in the cause. Yeah, I mean, remember where angles came from is the type of things. Like, people are like, well, exactly. I, you know, I, I I come from money. It's like, that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Mm. It's like, yeah. that, that doesn't make you an evil person. Like, we need all sorts. Mm. Exactly right. That's uh, the part of the, also the open-mindedness that, need be, that needs to be approached. You shouldn't allow yourself to devolve into purely ideological right. dribble, like ultra-left cringe garbage. But again, we're 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 kind of jumping the gun here, uh, which also never made sense to me as an English phrase. What the fuck does that <laughs> yeah. even mean? How would you jump over a gun? Depends on so, the size of the gun. It, it, it the comes gun. from it comes from racing, like foot racing. Uh, what the, gu- I see. the gun? Oh, used shit. To, to, to start the race, and you jump the gun as in you start moving before the gun goes off. Shit, you still don't jump makes technically, though. But <laughs> yeah, it, it makes sense. But it's still stupid. <laughs> yes, agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> maybe. Um, yeah. So essentially, like I was mentioning, yeah, you make it, you, you you carry out an appropriate mass line kind of back and forth to create the meat of the political analysis and as well as the political program that you have. At that point, then it's just popularization of the political program. Many things that we advocate for are generally things that people want, right? The issue is though, particularly with the American left, my God, the American left um, <laughs> is. They can't make it. They, they haven't managed to make it attractive, despite the fact that it is in the major in the in the interest of the vast majority of the American population. Mm-hmm. They're they're missing that the, the, that mass line bit of bringing it forward in a in a language and a context that they would understand. Of course, the history and and, and background of the Red Scare is is completely you know the anti communism yeah. in the U.S. Is, is of a different breed. JT would know better than I would, but uh, that doesn't change the fact that there is something that can be done. If you think like. 1920s China was any friendlier, <laughs> okay, uh, or you know at the same relative uh, period like 1905 to 1915 uh, Russia was any better than mm-hmm. eh, you know I I think we shouldn't always be like oh no but we have it harder now in many ways we have it far far easier yeah um, many more tools at your disposal both to educate yourself yeah. and to get your message across things like that so it's like don't take the easy way out don't. You know, I think part of the problem is is a lot of the people, a lot of the quote unquote left in the United States, is just liberals who like the aesthetic and the ideas who, and they they haven't done the reading yet. They haven't, mm. they don't really have a good understanding. Yeah. So they start talking about it. They're you know they're genuine about it. With, they talk about it with their friends, and then a, a, one friend says, uh, "Excuse me, what's neoliberalism?" Like a genuine question. And they just don't know how to answer. It's like, uh, well, uh, and then there you go. Then you look like an idiot, and then they, they don't take anything you have to say seriously. So it is mm. important to know what you're talking about, you know, even if you're you're very well-meaning. And I think the left on, in the U.S. Has, has a lot of work to do in that regard. Exactly right. One other important, very important aspect, actually, is something that is referred to as uh, the uh, dual power structure or building dual power. Um, this is something that's incredibly important prior to any revolutionary activity, and this is across the board. If you were to look at Cuba, if you were to look at Vietnam, China, uh, the USSR, and the preceding political structures, every single one of them had established essentially some form of dual power. What does this exactly mean? It means two things. Uh, number one, and this is the more fundamental form, I guess, is the creation of networks from this organization that are relatively decentralized, but they do exist, which can be essentially useful in all the functionings, all, all the requirements of uh, revolutionary activity. This in- in- includes military connections um, at parts. One of the b- biggest um, agitation efforts uh, at the time uh, in, in Russia, for example, was amongst um, those on the front. Uh, which is incredibly important. In other areas, this would be not very successful. I can imagine the United States military sector is not very conducive for this, and that's just right. because it's a volunteer army currently. Um, there are indications that the United States might need to go back to conscription, and when <laughs> that happens, yeah, it's gonna, yeah. it's gonna be, uh, it's, there, you're gonna get a uh, hefty pickings again. Yeah, yeah. or or a, um, or, a, or a front that is happening locally. You know, mm-hmm. somebody's yeah. actually moving into American territory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, easy yeah. pickings for radicalization. The People's Army of Canada. Yeah, <laughs> exactly right. I mean, Trudeau uh, no, just started fucking killing motherfuckers. So, <laughs> in twenty years, yeah. uh, Canadian yeah. America. I'm sorry, please. Sorry. <laughs> um, if they purge, they're French. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was, it was right there. I'm sorry. Um, another area, of course, is media. This may this takes a much larger form nowadays than uh, than it did back in the day because media is so ubiquitous that doesn't mean that it wasn't hugely important the um, Pravda which was the Bolshevik newspaper had a circulation of 40,000 I think 
um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but you have to remember that what would happen is one guy would buy it and then he'd go and stand in the middle of his factory essentially and be reading it out out loud to groups of like 200 workers. Yeah. So the the, re- the reach went much further. But much more importantly, it was one of the most widely read political um, newspapers uh, in, in uh, Tsarist Russia at the time, even though it was illegally spread depending on the time that we're t- discussing. That goes to show just how important it was to that organizational structure. This goes even more so now. You have to be on, as, as, as cringe as it's stupid as it sounds you have to be on fucking tiktok you have mm-hmm. to be on youtube you have to be on even the fucking the, 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 the facebook mom pages everywhere <laughs> yeah. you have to be you have to be ubiquitous your message has to be absolutely everywhere and you have to reiterate it to a point that nobody can do this bullshit where they try to skew what you're saying against you which is the most common form of yeah. anti-communism that we see in the in the u.s for example uh, i i keep referring to the u.s because the u.s is the preeminent anti-communist power um, they've, they've turned it into an art. And at, at one point, I, and at one point, like I didn't like lack of class consciousness should be in people's heads defined as I don't know being like childish, like unwise, mm-hmm. or against one's own interests or that of society. And, you know, sorry for my French, but a p- pussy bitch loser who likes <laughs> quite literally to be stepped on, and obviously not in a hot way, which I love. But <laughs> it, it, ironically, you gotta play to a wide range of reasons why members and future members of a particular organization would, in the first place, develop class consciousness, and you know, then work them down and that is obviously mm. done through through many many uh let's call them funnels and uh, uh pieces of in this case uh media and also directly physically inside of the organization itself but as, as, as hakim put it needs to be uh fucking drilled down not to the basics but drilled down to a point at which it is no longer even questionable it's like gravity yeah. it's like this is this is mm. logical because unironically compared to fascists we have a bit of an easier job here it is true it is actually true okay so this is probably the hardest part though in advanced capitalist economies like the u.s um to to establish that that the importance of class consciousness we are so incredibly brainwashed by anti-communist propaganda that anything even remotely critical of the free market is immediately dismissed as heresy by the average person, and you know that. And you have high mean... standards as well. I mean, that's the problem yeah. in the whole first world. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, it's, no, it's, no. It's, we talked about it before. You know, we have it easier in certain aspects. We have it harder. But ironically, as ironic as it is, and this has been said by much more brilliant Marxists than me, uh, you know, why it's li- less likely. But we'll talk about this later. About you know, for a revolution to happen in the first world, is quite literally where's the fucking motivation, blood? And then mm-hmm. on top of that, what JT beautifully said, you know, almost. I mean, literally almost 100 years of Red Scare propaganda together mm. with, you know, why the fuck should I care? I, even though they're on loans, I got two cars and a house. Yeah. You know, suck right. my Capitalist dick. nihilism. Yeah. Yeah. Capitalist yeah. nihilism and anti- supreme anti-communism is a disgusting combination, but it's, it's very a, effective. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that we can't get through to these people, you know? Yeah. I think all of us can attest to that. We've all gotten comments or emails from people thanking us for changing their minds. It's, mm. you know, it's just that the... Deeply. You mean brainwashing? Yeah, yeah, but, you, you, you but you don't even need to. Like, they might have a house and two cars alone. Their kids are not. And then their kids' kids are mm. definitely not. Well, following rate of profit, second my dick. No, no, yes, absolutely this. But also, like, it, it, it is inevitable. This You can't, mm-hmm. like, keep paying the tab for uh, have the future exactly. generations keep paying your tab. You Excellent cannot. Point. Eventually, it, it like, class consciousness is absolutely inevitable. Or, unfortunately, also, you know, reactionary sentiment which right. that at the end of the day can be that's that's one thing that is important to, to keep in mind you know it, even if we consider it to be inevitable which you know uh, can be a dangerous perspective i think in some cases yes, if yes, we're yes. like oh it will happen mm-hmm. it will happen but you know it takes work too it takes time and patience and a different approach for each person you speak to and if we want to be brutally honest like you were saying with the reactionary mm-hmm. stuff some people are just a lost cause you might yeah. not win over Uncle Steve. You know, you have to use your time and energy wisely. You have to learn mm. to, to identify who has the potential for positive change and and who doesn't. And I think that Ugopnik is right that, that ridicule or at least harsh criticism can mm. be a useful tool in helping stubborn people adjust their perspective or uh, probably more accurately showing others in the orbit of that stubborn person mm. that you're a loser if you don't have <laughs> class consciousness. Like no one likes to be attacked directly. 
but everybody loves to gossip about the shortcomings of others. So if you know if that yeah. becomes a, a gossip point or like, oh, you know, he's not class conscious. He doesn't understand mm. the, the, the the inherent contradictions of the capitalist system. Ooh. He listens to Ben Shapiro. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Then that'll start to kind of snowball, and people are like, oh, he mm. is a loser, isn't he? Or like, it needs to be a similar <laughs> thing to like when somebody you know just like in capitalism, somebody just managed to get some money, and immediately and they go and buy a fancy car. Everybody's mm-hmm. like, dude, this is so irrational. At least you know semi financially conscious people they're gonna right. be, dude, that's what the fuck same as somebody you know you, you you go to work you go to the factory you go to the corporate office you go to wherever and you see somebody like working their fucking dick off in order to you know satisfy the boss it at, at, at pre-revolutionary stages the perspective towards that should inherently be like the fuck is this motherfucker doing mm, like this yeah. is fucking imbecilic levels of class consciousness need to be achieved both inside of the organization and outside but obviously there's going to be a lot of uncle joe's and so on which whose minds are not necessarily going to be changed but npcs are going to be npcs during a revolution before a revolution and after a revolution yeah. you yep. think every single member of a future socialist society is you know a, going to be a sharp believer in socialism just how like i don't know i can't use a percentage but not everybody is called you know wakes up in the morning he's like now i'm going to go and serve capitalism great because this point. is the the greatest great you know mode of production and all they're just going to be you know bystanders and so on as long as they do not take up ideological arms yeah, yeah exactly as long as they do not take part in ideological reproduction of reactionary sentiment or uh, do not directly counter uh, countermine uh, countermine counteract uh, socialist uh, perspectives then, then let them be fucking bystanders we will help them even if they do not want to be helped mm-hmm. god bless you know a great uh, christian and muslim kind of perspective to have mm-hmm. but yeah. uh, and Rand still got an education and education from the soviets honestly exactly, the, yeah. one, the only mistake that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Soviets made. <laughs> but yeah, it, it eventually it spreads, and to the ones that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't need to. Yeah, yeah. There's several points that I would like to make. Oh, very beautifully said from from both of you. I would say um to add on to JT's point that we should be careful with thinking that things are inevitable. Like socialism is inevitable. Socialism isn't inevitable. What is inevitable is the point at which the class contradictions that currently exist and the contradictions of capitalism get exactly. to such a point that the tension reaches such a point mm-hmm. that the appropriate moment for revolution and the transition to socialism presents itself. Mm-hmm. Now we the issue is we need to be ready for that. Right? Organizations need to be in place. The work needs to be done amongst uh, uh, the relevant you know class groupings that we're trying to uh, reach all that and when that happens then we can actually take advantage of the situation and bring bring about or attempt to bring about a better world uh, for the vast majority of people um otherwise then we just end up falling into reaction and all that kind of bullshit like uh, look if you had one shot or one opportunity <laughs> this bomb is exactly. needs, like famously yeah. said by stalin you know yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly right dude uh, now because of the ai edits some people have taken some stalin speeches and his voice and they start doing uh like you know him speaking other but people don't know stalin's voice right so it's just but yeah, yeah. It was, somebody needs to make this edit anyways that's the first point uh the second point is the the thing about media and and spreading to media building building these networks particularly within the media is our message has to be so ubiquitous and explicit in what we want to bring about of course after the process of the mass line and correct and blah 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 it has to be so explicit that nobody can even dare to try to paint in what you want incorrectly as yeah. in for example they're like oh we want to take your toothbrush it has to be so clear it's like that's clearly yes. not what they want because yeah. it's I see it on the walls every time I go to to work and it's on my fucking TV screen and it's on my pa pa however ways that you can try to make it happen but that's you know they can't deny or they can't try to paint you as some fucking caricature right um, yes 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 quote, yes yeah to quote lenin they they, they love with marxism they they love to instead of paint a straw man of marxism then defeat the straw man and then just like prance around that's a bad paraphrasing of, of lenin but you know what i'm trying mm-hmm, to say mm-hmm. that's number point number two uh about the point with you got where you mentioned the motivations of advanced capitalist countries currently and whether they want revolution or not you can refer to a very good and balanced discussion about this uh you refer to our episode where we interviewed torka mm-hmm. uh, where we go into this point otherwise you can read torka Lawson's books which are, go very deeply into this point um the global perspective is the I think his best and most like a concise work uh, about this currently, but we'll de- delve deeper into this point in uh, then when once we get to the day of the re- revolution or preliminary post revolutionary period. Uh, if I can things. just hop in real quick to and return Please to the, the ubiquity of the of the message thing, I think right now what we have is the complete opposite of what we need. We have mm. the right who has completely dominated yeah. 
the the messaging for what communism is, what the left is. So, you know, you go on YouTube and you're immediately served not one, but like 15 videos by right wing hacks like Jordan Peterson, yeah. Ben Shapiro, all the rest. And they're all giving you the same bullet points that socialists do want to take your toothbrush. You know, they do want to trample your freedoms. <laughs> they do want to establish the gay caliphate, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever it is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they all want to sleep, want you to sleep under one blanket. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's that is they understand and the importance of the ubiquity of mm. the message. And so we yeah. need to <laughs> tear that down, but do what they have done. Look to them mm. as an example of how to do it correctly because they're very yeah. good at it. Yeah, keep in mind that they can manage to do this because they have tremendous fucking Enormous. wealth behind them. Uh, like beyond. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if anybody ever wonders, by the way, oh, like, oh, the left is supposed to be oh, the fucking postmodern. If that was r- truly the case, then you would see these perspectives mm-hmm. that we're trying to bring forward actually everywhere. You don't see that. You see lukewarm liberal bullshit and and the, the the vomit and vitriol and just disgusting nonsense that you see, the the toxic waste that spilled from the mouths mm. of the Crowders and Shapiros and all the other uh, garbage that exists. Going back to the point of dual power, of course, I was mentioning the networks that you're establishing. This is first, this, we're still in the preliminary, you know, like the, the basic networks that are being established. We mentioned military connections of all sorts. We mentioned, for example, media, um, student groups and, and existence within um, like almost all levels of education you can you can get into, uh, particularly universities, because these have been very fruitful areas for this. Um, one mistake is to focus on student groups. A revolution is not made of students. <laughs> no revolution has ever been made, successfully carried out by students. It's usually more of the adventurous elitist type of you know cringe um so you want to avoid that but uh, students are still very fruitful for this because the students of today um that are studying the relevant things that are ideologically motivated will be the people who manage to apply through the expertise that they've picked up all the daily motions and 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 requirements of the state and running all the important things that we need to once they you know once the revolution does come um so that's also incredibly important um of course, meeting the demands and requirements and, 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 and wishes uh, of all sorts of minority groups that are progressive, of course. Um, I'm sure the KKK is technically a minority group <laughs> yeah. in the United States. It doesn't mean that we need to meet what they're, what they're, what they're saying. This is part of the correct analysis Miami again. Cubans, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So you do need to be aware of all these points. This is, uh, there's many more, you know, like preliminary networks that need to be established, but I'll move on from this point and then move on to the, the secondary, much more larger dual power point, which differs depending on the region and country and time and level of revolutionary development that you have. In some places, it was as simple as just having a network of um, getting messages across, essentially, um, that the, the state couldn't be, or, you know, the repressive arms of the state couldn't get to. This is, like, more to the Cuban example. To other examples where you had entire cities and industry and, and like, dams and, and stuff built and, and, and controlled and maintained by the communists in China before they, well, this is this is years before they took power, right? They had entire regions that were, like, red bases, essentially, mm-hmm. which had um, their own, essentially, like, microcosm or what they want for the rest of China to be. This included like their own administrative structure. This included their own currency yeah. or like issuing of like an entire state functioning and everything in between. The Soviet example is kind of in between the two. Um, the Soviets, uh, like, uh, meaning the councils that existed within mm-hmm. Petrograd and then eventually Moscow and a bunch of other cities um, had enough representatives between uh, and enough clout to the general population to be able to essentially skirt the administrative directives of the central government at the time. They became more important and more representative of political will, not only like um, ideologically, but also through the ability to execute on what was what was being passed um, than the central government, these, these Soviets, these councils. Um, the way that these can be built are very numerous and it depends on the, the, the stage of the struggle. I can't give you a blueprint. None of this is meant to be a blueprint. It's just supposed to get you to, to think. Um, but a, stu- a, a concrete study of the Cuban, Russian, and Chinese examples would get you very far uh, in, in understanding exactly what you're supposed to do. Um, the, if you want a very concrete example of the preliminary stages of this, the Black Panthers in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, would be the best example for something that is, um, uh, what would you say, in an advanced capitalist country, essentially, that is still heavily ruled by capital. They got very far. They were nipped Absolutely. in the bud, sadly. They could have become way bigger uh, and way more important, way more influential and all that. But they were, you know, they got the... Uh, and combined with other organizations and so on. But yeah. Yeah. They got the COINTELPRO special. They got steamrolled, mm. unfortunately. They were mm. so cool, all the stuff they did. Eh. Alas. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, an, e- an easy way to think of, to remember the, the dual power stuff is just you, your goal is to establish a government in waiting. You know, you want to have, mm. you want to be prepared to step in 
when the time comes for stepping in. That's about that. You know, all this stuff is very, you know, that's super simple. But if you're trying to explain it to mm-hmm. somebody, that's a good way to do it. No, exactly yeah. right. And you need, especially like since you mentioned the Black Panthers, you need an insanely strong vetting process, obviously, for mm-hmm. leadership. All other groups, in my opinion, must work as uh, cells. I mean, you saw we saw that specifically with Bolsheviks. So while they are at least before you know the actual revolution started, back before they were organizing and so on. So uh, you know while the cells are connected to the center. Uh, and they can get information and orders from the center if they are to be infiltrated, taken over or sabotaged, they do not hurt the center per se. Uh, a modern example of this is obviously like this is not a good example, but it's how cartels work and why mm-hmm. cartels have managed to exist for so long, no matter how much money was invested in order to destroy them. Obviously, additionally to once you create these uh, these organizations, you need to not just exist in your own little bubble or whatever the fuck, but you need to actually create a presence in the communities you are in, as obviously Hakim said. But now, I don't know, apply to literally what can you do physically? Let's use a, like super random examples as, for example, food banks or donation centers or like, you know, ecological task force or I don't know, depending on the culture of the particular country you live in, even, you know, small community protecting militias and so on but you know make sure all of this most of our listeners probably know and shit but one thing like always make sure to like actually <laughs> involve the local community in the <laughs> tasks that you're yeah. doing because a lot of people go out and they help a lot of people right they go out and they help a lot they get a lot of homeless people fed they you know get some pedophiles or some drug dealers or whatever the fuck depending on the country what, what is popular and so on but uh, once you actually get the local community to participate in the thing that you're doing, they are much more likely going to uh, choose to join or change their opinion about your particular organization and so on. Specifically, if, if we talk about food banks, don't just, you know, go and, you know, now it's me, JT, and Hakim, and we're feeding all these people. No, invite people from that particular neighborhood to also come be part of the organization. They don't have to pay anything. For example, they can just be, you know, the people that are serving the soup, the people that are that are there, and you guys are going to bring the food, etc., etc., etc. You get to talking, you get to expanding. Super ridiculously tiny, tiny example. But one, when organizations are actually actually trying to uh, to do good things for the community, yes, great, G- bravo, tap yourself on the back, you're really helping people around. But remember, this is going to sound disgusting, but I don't care. But remember but that this is another tactic of getting people also on your side. So while help, it's a win-win. Go out, help out, but remember the core, core reason why you are doing this. And mm-hmm. that is yeah. the long-term goal of revolution, which can only be achieved by getting people uh, on your fucking boat. A good analogy for, for this is Mao's quote, which is the, the party cadre, so a member of the organization, should be like a fish in water, and the water is, is the masses, the groups of people you're trying to reach. You have to be completely fluid to move through through them, right, as if you're part of them and one with them, uh, but also be distinct in your ideological role because at the end of the day, you're supposed to be impacting a particular. What we are doing is not charity because charity at the end of the day, depending, I mean, the way that Western charity is currently set up is yeah. completely inefficacy. It's not meant to change anything. We don't want charity. What we want to do is we want to ideologically educate people through positive work that could look like charity. Um, and in the end, through this, essentially show like, This is what we can do with such simple, basic things that we have at our disposal. Imagine if we had the actual powers and tools of the state to be able to administer all these things correctly and appropriately. Um, So they could be more equally spread. Everybody can have equitable access and it could be affordable or completely free depending on the like healthcare, for example, education, etc. And also picking the leadership, obviously now different ideological currents inside of Marxism will very <laughs> intensively disagree on this. But, you know, whatever field you're in, be it, you know, you, you need an actual uh, leadership who represents the most knowledgeable, yeah. most experienced uh, uh cadres of uh, different aspects of what a particular revolutionary organization needs to do or I don't know you're an anarchist and you know we gotta vote if we're gonna take a shit now or after <laughs> we we uh, march five miles down the line mm-hmm. uh, no, I'm kidding you know, I'm not making fun I love them but uh, uh, no matter wh- wh- where you stand you need to always remember that uh, you can't really run an organization that is 
talking about how at the end of the day they're going to uh, whose long 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 term goal is the destruction of unjustified hierarchies right and then you are sticking to your position as the is the big man as if like this is the only thing that you ever wanted in life everyone serves their particular purpose inside of a particular organization if you have the particular skills that are necessary for management and leadership you should be there because that is what your skills can do yeah. you being in management or leadership does not mean that you are better than uh you know the guy working the fucking yeah. latrines you are just better at this he unfortunately is better for a bad example but you get my point it is yeah. better at that there is no uh obviously there is a kind of more stress in certain positions versus others but uh but you should never start developing the feeling of superiority inside of the organization only because you funnily enough uh, are in a position that in capitalism and in you know the capitalist ideology is defined as more important mm -hmm. uh we're kind of trying to abolish that whole thing and i see very much in like you guys have probably seen it be it in fledgling organizations or larger obviously not the, to the level of revolutionary that we're talking about here but you know uh, a lot of organizations kind of dying out because somebody you know just gets yeah. to the top position and just yeah. uh you know grinds it to the halt because of uh, poor management but they don't want to step reasons, down yeah. because they uh, they think that they know best more importantly i think and this adds on to your next point uh, is that what no matter what form of like leadership organization you need, you decide on um of course democratically blah blah blah. In some cases it needs to be centralized and in some cases it has to be decentralized that's the correct approach it depends on your material conditions in some cases you're going to need to be completely almost independently acting in different sectors in other cases you're going to have to have essentially unity to the point of being one fist mm -hmm. uh, particularly in very straight this is this comes very close to the um, one, the day of the revolutionary preliminary post-revolutionary period that's kind of the importance really of, of a strict unity uh comes into play because you know a house divided oh, what's the there's an american saying a house, house divided, divided cannot, cannot stand yeah exactly right thank you yeah um amongst other things uh that we can build on in those uh, relative episodes all right with all this being said uh, this is the first part of a three-part series that we're planning on um this is the right before the revolution but uh the next episode uh, inshallah will be the day of the revolution so the actual happenings in the 24 48 72 hours of what's going on what needs to what needs to occur in that first uh immediate uh point and of course the final part uh, will be the preliminary post-revolutionary period so this is the first weeks and months uh of re revolution to kind of summarize what we said here today, all this, of course, as mentioned, is not a blueprint. This is a uh, summary and a creative retelling, let's say, of uh, historical examples as well as essentially what theory teaches us. And that's why you it's very important to read theory so that you can get to the nitty gritty of this and also see where the pitfalls are and what worked. Of course, analysis of history and a correct political analysis of history follows. But to kind of summarize all of it into one point. Fundamentally, no revolutionary movement exists without revolutionary theory, of course. Once you have revolutionary theory, you need to have organizations. Organizations are bit the bread and butter of which is to actually know what you're talking about. The base of this organizational structure is, number one, a correct political analysis, meaning a class analysis of the area or society and time that you're currently living in, uh, and as well as a creative application of the mass line. This will allow you to develop a skeleton of a political program that will then afterwards also allow you to populate said skeleton with the important and uh, attractive points that you can can bring to 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 you know the working class or whatever other classes you're trying to attract uh, towards this proletarian socialist movement to bring about socialism. You have to be very aware that at some points revolution is not feasible, and other points it is very very feasible. The point of an organization is to always be ready theoretically, as well as have the rapport with the general population to be able to jump into action when it needs to when it needs to happen. The point that brings revolution forward as lenin said uh, there are days where years happen and years where days happen um it can come like that right and if it does uh come in such a sudden way to be caught with the with your pants down as, as americans say uh where you haven't done the appropriate political work you haven't been talking to people you haven't developed a proper and accurate political program you have not developed anything that resembles a mass line then this is just essentially handing over the period of crisis to the reaction and this will result not only in the killing uh and and and, and imprisoning and the oppression of a vast majority of all the undesirables which 
I think every single person listening to this at some point or another could be considered. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's incredibly dangerous. But also, it is a uh, severe failing of the entire point of the organization. Much more importantly, when you develop this political program and the 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 necessarily you know mass line points you need to start bringing the work much more publicly you need to develop appropriate networks this goes into the point of the you know general as well as more central or 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 uh, uh, executively and concretely formed dual power in the preliminary stage it's appropriate connections with military groups with 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 student groups and other minority uh, associated groups that are positive uh, mind you so not the kkk as mentioned you need to have connections with the with the media and be able to make your message absolutely ubiquitous so people cannot deny you or much worse try to paint you as some you know completely misconstrue what you're trying to say intentionally misrepresent what you're trying to do so that they could discredit you of course this more concrete form of dual power is usually more politically oriented to uh, allow yourself to kind of establish a a uh, uh, independent political structure essentially as JT said a, a government in waiting this is incredibly important and this is the example best illustrated by the Chinese uh, in the revolution and of course always 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 reiterate you have to be firmly grounded in a correct political line which is centered on an appropriate class analysis of your current material conditions of the class groups that you have in society the contradictions that you that exist and what which contradictions are resolvable which aren't what that resolution will particularly look like again not to not to re-emphasize this point too much but the chinese uh, example is the the Chinese Revolution is the example of how this was done in a very detailed way. Of course, the Soviets need to be uh, analyzed too, and likewise with the Cuban idea. Much more importantly, stay safe. <laughs> uh, and all buy this merch. Because, uh, the, the first yeah. step of a revolution is buying merch <laughs> buy, exactly of right. three fucking dudes with a microphone. Yeah. Exactly mm-hmm. right. Uh, so yes, buy merch. Um, <laughs> support us on Patreon. Unironically. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> give money, give gold. <laughs> and this has been the D program. I'm Hakim. I'm JT. And I'm Yugopnik, and revolutionary vegetarian dick is the best. <laughs> <laughs>